achievements, it would chronicle the major historical events that had shaped their growth, and it would, perhaps most importantly, really put a spotlight on the impact that they had on their communities. So of course, my mind mentioned what immediately to these stories. Uh, and I thought, oh, this is going to be so easy. I'm going to collect these stories from these bankers, and it's going to be wonderful. And at this point, I feel compelled to point out, in light of all well, these earlier remarks on failure, that I'm foreshadowing my own inevitable failure in this endeavor right now. So one by one, I would call these bankers, and I would sit at my dining room table, and I had my cell phone in one hand, my pen poised in the other hand to take notes. And one by one, I would ask them to tell me stories about their time working at the bank. And I would get back the most horrible, awful, dry anecdotes that you could possibly imagine. I would throw out questions like, you know, tell me a story about you know, the day that the Great Reception started in 2008, and tell me a story about that day. And they would say, well, we got a lot of phone calls that day. And I would try something else. You know, tell me a story about your favorite customer who came into the bank. And still I would get these awful dry anecdotes that you would never want to publish in a coffee table book that you would actually want people to read. So I'm panicking. I'm trying to think, what, you know, what am I doing wrong? What can I possibly be doing differently? And in a sort of desperation hail Mary, you know, I have to deliver this book. I changed my approach slightly. And I want to share with you the outcome of that change of approach. And the story begins like this. I had been a father for just 47 days when I found myself looking down the barrel of a sod on a shotgun. It was five minutes before closing on December 17th when two masked men burst into the bank. Put your head down or I'll kill you, I remember one of them saying as they made me lay face down on the floor. They had rounded up the female tellers, who were also now laying face down beneath the Christmas tree that had been in the front window of the branch. Now they say that things run through your mind right before you die. And all I could think about was my newborn son and how he wouldn't have a father. So the story goes on to detail how these two masked men escaped through the woods into their cabin and their hideaway where they were probably discovered the next day by the authorities. How that possibly might ask? Well, I mentioned that this took place in December, but I didn't tell you where it took place. Um, and it was actually in upstate New York, where I grew up. And if any of you are from upstate New York, if you've ever visited there, you know that, you know, come December around the holidays, we usually have about three feet of snow on the ground. So all the authorities had to do was simply trace their steps through the woods to where they were hiding. And perhaps my favorite part of the story is that when they recovered all of the money from the duffel bag, there was actually more in the bag than had been taken from the bank's vaults. So at the end of the day, the bank actually profited on this whole ordeal. So finally, they gave me a story that I could actually do something with, and I'm so excited. So what did I do differently? The only thing that I did was actually a really simple change. I didn't ask him to tell me a story. I asked him to describe a memory or to recall an experience. And believe it or not, that simple shift can make a huge difference when you are on the hot seat as a storyteller. So at our core, we are all storytellers. Humans have told stories to one another since the beginning of time. It's one of the most effective ways that you can communicate with one another. But stories, and the word story itself, can feel kind of intimidating. You know, we're surrounded, we're inundated by stories today from corporations, from organizations that want something from us, that want us to do something. So the word story itself has almost lost a little bit of meaning. You know, when we think about telling stories to one another, we're not focused on whether our hook is strong enough or whether the moral of our story is coming through strong enough. We're not thinking about whether our character is sympathetic to our audience. You know, we're not thinking about whether we've got enough tension in the story to make people stay engaged with us. We just don't think of any of that stuff in our day-to-day -day storytelling. So I'm guessing if I were to ask you right now to tell me a story about how you and your design work has impacted someone's life, it would kind of feel a little intimidating. Maybe a little bit like I don't even know where to start. But if I were to slightly reframe that and say, and instead, you describe a moment for me where you feel like you made a difference, that might feel a little bit more doable. And so that is my first secret to unleashing your inner storyteller is to just completely 
throw away the word story from your vocabulary. Just get rid of it. It's overused, it's oversaturated, and it's <coughs> So I want to share with you four other principles that I learned in my work with all kinds of different types of organizations from the very small to the very large, from those that have very big budgets to those with very low budgets, and kind of everything in between. And the great thing is that these four things really apply whether you are writing it down, whether you are filming it and sharing it as a video, whether you are sharing an image, or if you're just simply telling a story face to face like I'm doing today. So the first one is that you have to make someone else the hero. And this one is really difficult for organizations to embrace. Think about all the stories that you hear coming from organizations, from corporations, from nonprofits. And I'm guessing that they all follow sort of a similar format. It's let us tell you about how we impacted someone else. And the emphasis is quite often on the we. And there's a flaw in this. And that's that audiences relate to the story of an individual, not of an organization. There's been tons of research done on this, particularly in the fundraising space, around what resonates with donors. And what we see time and time again is that it's the story of an individual. It's not a group. It's not even two people and certainly not a nameless, faceless organization. But yet, at the same time, what we see in our research is that nearly half of all organizational stories actually position the organization themselves as the hero. So what is the solution? How do we get around this? Well, I like to think of making the organization the supporting character in the story rather than the main character. And a great example of this comes from this video that I like to share from Google. Organizations that do this really 
well, and they, they do such a brilliant job with this. For example, Cherry Water. They tell stories like Helen's. So Helen is a woman who lives in northern Uganda, and she used to walk a mile and a half to the nearest water station to her village. So she would walk there, she would get there and wait in line with hundreds of other women who are asked to accomplish the same thing, which is to bring clean water back to their families. She would make the trip back, and when she got there, the water would be allocated to drinking and cooking and laundry. And at the end of the day, she had neither the time nor the resources to allocate any of it to her own needs. So now that she has a um, well located in her village, she has more than enough clean water and time to not only meet the needs of her family, but also to meet, meet her own needs. And she can take a shower. And she says that she feels beautiful. And so yes, technically, Charity Water is providing access to clean drinking water, but they're also providing dignity and beauty and time and opportunity and all of these other universal needs that we as human beings can connect with, even if we've never experienced the need for clean drinking water in our lives. So think about the designs that you create that at face value, they're meeting needs for structure, for shelter, for services. But if you think more broadly, what are the universal needs that, that your designs are meeting? If you frame your experience in terms of what connects us, what makes us similar as humans, instead of the things that may make us different, your stories will appeal to a much broader audience. Again, if you make it universal, it instantly becomes very intensely personal, and it's kind of funny how that works. The third thing that I've learned is that you have to make something happen in your stories. So what do I mean by making I mean that they have to have plot, they have to have structure. Too often in storytelling, we get a really clear picture of the after, but we don't get the before or the during, and what we're left with is essentially a testimonial, and a testimonial isn't the same thing as a story. Picture those late night infomercials on TV that sell fitness videos. I can't possibly be the only person who has watched those and immediately purchased whatever they're selling. You get this really nice after picture, right, of the person they have their six pack, they're healthy, they're lean, they're strong, they're fit. But that after picture doesn't mean anything at all if you don't see the before picture, because it's the before picture that really gives you a sense for the sheer magnitude of the transformation. So you need to take people on a journey. You need to provide this structure. A story at its core, it's not about that something has changed. It's about how something and there's a really key distinction there. So if you take your audience on a journey, you provide them with these structural cues that we all have learned as children. Uh, we've heard these in books and movies, things like once upon a time, there was an architect, and every day the architect went to work and created an amazing thing. So these structural cues are so strong that your ear tells you them immediately, telling you a story, and I just look complete nonsense in between those cues, and it would still sound like a story, and it would still actually kind of make sense. So you need to bring them along with you on the journey. Focus more on the journey, and the destination will mean more once you get there. And finally, my, my last takeaway that I've learned is that good stories don't tell, they show. A couple of years ago, I made my triumphant return to the musical theater world in an off, off, of Les Miserables, where I played one of the old ladies who buys Fontaine's hair. And this was after I hadn't performed at any shows since high school, so this was a big comeback for me. And the director that we worked with, he imparted these really wonderful words of wisdom that I carried with me and I've applied to my storytelling work almost every day. And what he said was that you can't feel all of the things for your audience. You have to let them feel things for themselves. And the way that that translates to storytelling is that you can't tell somebody that you're sad, that you're frustrated, that you're angry, that you're anxious. The best way and the way to make a more compelling story is to actually show those emotions through the way you speak, through your body language, through the things that you do, through the way that you interact with your surroundings, through the details. So this will come as no surprise to you because I'm sure that this is true in the work that you do as much as it is in, in the work of storytelling, but what really brings a story to life is detail. It's detail that can paint a picture of the before. What does it look like? What does it sound like? What does it smell like? What does it taste like? And it's the details that can bring that after picture to life. What does it look like and feel like and smell like? 
Think back to the Google video. The real story in there was the sound of the airplane landing. It gives you that nod of anticipation in your stomach. It was in the sound of the wedding bells ringing. It was in the sound of the child laughing at the end. The story that I told you at the beginning about the bank robbery, the real crux of that was in the smell of the Christmas tree and the lights twinkling in the window and the feel of the concrete floor on your stomach if you have to lie face down on it. These are the things that really bring your stories to life. Details, a plot, a universal connection, and a hero who's not the original. So if I'm the ad, I want to answer a big question, which is why do we even bother telling stories in the first place, let alone trying to tell them better? Well, you can tell people about an issue like the failing transportation policy in a city like Detroit. You can throw out statistics, you can use data to make your case, or you can simply share the story of James Robertson, who every day walked 21 miles back and forth to work. So a few months ago, uh, a reporter for the Detroit Free Press followed him and chronicled his journey, how he gets two hours of sleep every single night and gets up and does the whole thing again, how he's never been late for work a single day in his career, and how he's been doing this since 1988. Now that story took off, it went viral, and it inspired not only an outpouring of donations, people gave $250,000 in a crowdfunding campaign, but I think more importantly, it inspired a public conversation about the issues that led to this. And a story can do that where data and statistics alone couldn't. Or you could talk about housing policy in Baltimore and how the housing mobility program in the city of Baltimore is so much better than comparable ones across the country. You could show statistics about the number of families who have been moved from areas of low economic opportunity to areas of high economic opportunity. Or you could introduce them to women like Tasha, who used to have to steal away in the early morning in her neighborhood so that she could breathe fresh air outside of her neighborhood at a time, the only time during the day, when she didn't hear sounds of gunshots or fighting or sirens. And you can tell the story about how now she can go outside with her family, have a picnic in the wide open green spaces of their suburban home. Or finally, you could tell people about the impact that your company has on the lives of others, or you can show them, as OfficeMax does in the class book that I want to share with you. Hello, uh, my name is Courtney Lobert, and uh, your company OfficeMax surprised me in my talk room today. Well, you know that I'm so grateful to you. <laughs> and on behalf of my 27 first graders in the city school, where we frequently feel forgotten. It was such a gift to know today that people saw how hard we work, and not just me, but my students every day. And just to know that we're supported and people believe in us. I'm so grateful. It was so encouraging. The kids kept asking me if it was Christmas. <laughs> It was really incredible. It was such a gift, not just to me, but of course to my first grader because you really made our day. And I wanted to make sure that you were me today. Thank you. From the first grade teacher who no longer feels forgotten. Thank you. So I wasn't kidding about seeing you wanting to make you cry at Easter. <laughs> so is this a perfect story? No, it's not. But it doesn't need to be. If you have a good story to share, the presentation doesn't matter. So don't worry about whether or not it's perfect. Don't worry about whether it conforms to the standard Hollywood definition of what a story is. As architects, you create beauty every single day in your work. You inspire people with your creativity and with your design. The structures and buildings that you create tell stories themselves. So my hope is that for these few days that we're together here in Atlanta, that you'll be inspired to go back to the forest and to tell your stories 